Hi, everybody. My name is Karen Strauss, and I'm a principal research manager at Microsoft. And today I'm going to talk about storing digital data in DNA and computing with molecules. Uh, this is a collaboration between Microsoft and University of Washington, and together we created the Molecular Information Systems Lab to study what biology and chemistry can do for computer science and for uh, information technology. So let's start with, with a problem. Storage capacity uh, is growing a lot slower than our ability to generate uh, data. So what I'm showing here in the, these plots, on the left-hand side, I'm showing a study by IDC showing uh, the speed at which the digital universe has been growing. And uh, the bottom curve is how fast devices to store the information has been growing. So as you can see there, over the years, the gap has been increasing, and we think that's a problem. It's not like we need to store all the data we generate, um, but we actually want to store a portion of it. And the reason the gap is concerning is what I'm showing here on the right-hand side, uh, where you're seeing the evolution over time of the portion of the data we'll be able to store out of all the data we generate if we simply follow this trend. So we think that to put a dent on this problem, we need to change uh, the approach. So let me illustrate uh, what I mean with changing the approach. So here I'm showing two icons of the computing era. And um, so on the left-hand side, I have more. And uh, many of you have heard, if not all of you, have heard of Moore's Law. So Moore's Law essentially states that the number of uh, transistors doubles every so often. And so uh, the whole computing industry has been relying on increasing the number of devices on a chip and doing more with that, and just shrinking them and doing more with new devices because they have more transistors, they can do more. To contrast this approach with the molecular approach, which is, is what I'm talking about, um, is uh, uh, an example here is Feynman. So in one of his famous lectures, Feynman essentially advocated that if we can arrange the atoms in whatever way we want, um, then the, um, we, we should be able to store and compute with, uh, directly with uh, atoms and molecules. And in fact, in, in this lecture, he even uh, used DNA as an example of information storage uh, with molecules. So he pointed out that DNA molecules, they use about 50 atoms to, to store about one bit of information. He stopped short of really suggesting that we use that in, in the industry, in the computing industry. Um, but that idea didn't, didn't take very long to surface. And in fact, a few years later, uh, it was observed that you could also, if you could manipulate how to make uh, DNA molecules, you could store digital information in DNA. All right, so let's see what uh, DNA data storage is. If you think of DNA, we learn about DNA as that double helix. Each side of that double helix is a sequence of four types of bases, A, C, G, and T. And so, uh, DNA and our genome is essentially uh, a, a combination of these four uh, bases in different sequences. If we want to store bits in DNA, all we have to do is take a sequence of bits and convert that into a sequence of bases, of DNA bases. Uh, so here I'm showing a simple mapping where uh, we're taking every two bits and converting that into a different base. So 0, 0 corresponds to A, 0, 1 to C, and so forth and so on. Um, the mapping that we use in uh, reality is actually more sophisticated than that, but this is more to illustrate the point here that we can translate bits to bases. And then uh, now we have the technology uh, to produce these molecules in arbitrary sequences. And so uh, the technology uh, can produce molecules with arbitrary sequences that we determine from 150 to 200 bases, and we store uh, the information, we fabricate these molecules of DNA with the arbitrary sequences. Now, so this is synthetic DNA, so to be very clear, there's no organisms, no life, it's just the DNA used as a medium, like tape is used to store information. Uh, so why would we want to use uh, DNA to store digital information? The first 
The first argument for it is density. So here what I'm showing is a test tube, the pink smear you see in the bottom of that test tube, and you can compare the size of that to the pencil that's next to it, uh, is equivalent DNA to store about 10 terabytes of data, which is what uh, can be stored in hard drives uh, today, right? So uh, quite denser uh, than, than hard drives. And what this translates when we talk about data centers is that the information stored in a uh, building like this, uh, which today can house about, uh, house about one exabyte of information, if scaled to the size of DNA, can be about that size. So it is a scaled size. It's essentially a pixel in my slide, but really in reality, that one, um, that one exabyte of data uh, fits in the palm of your hand. So it's about a cubic inch of uh, volume. Uh, that can fit one exabyte of information stored in DNA. So density is uh, quite important, and, and we think that it will be pretty important for uh, storing information long term, so archival storage. Next property, which is also important for archival storage, is how long the data lasts when stored in a particular media. And so DNA uh, can store thousands of years. In fact, in nature, there's demonstrations of DNA keeping the information for hundreds of thousands of years. But scientists have also developed ways to encapsulate the DNA to create conditions similar to conditions uh, that happen in nature that will conserve, preserve the, the DNA for a long time. And in fact, these conditions are not that difficult to keep. And in fact, the sheer density of uh, DNA as a medium also helps uh, with that task. So it's, it's very easy to keep those conditions for a small volume. So that begs a comparison uh, with other commercial storage media. Uh, here I'm showing a, a, a set of different commercial media and comparing that with DNA. Uh, the plot is comparing density and then there's durability uh, compared below. Um, for density, what you're seeing there is um, the, the bottom part is where those uh, technologies uh, were when we, uh, when we created this plot a couple of years ago. Uh, and then uh, the next part of those bars are where we expect the technology to get to. And for DNA, what you're seeing, um, the top of the bar there is where we expect uh, the limit of uh, the density for DNA to be, but obviously uh, that's the theoretical uh, limit. And if we're building a system with DNA, just like the other, uh, the other type of media, uh, there's an overhead associated with uh, creating a system. And so even when we discount that overhead, we still get a few orders of magnitude improvement uh, compared to the densest existing technology, which today is tape. Another property of DNA is that now that we know how to read DNA, we'll always be able to, uh, to read it. So we'll always have technology uh, to read the DNA. And the medium itself doesn't change, it's just the DNA. But the readers uh, can improve, and they can improve independently of uh, the medium itself, which is, is not really the case for, for other types of commercial medium. And finally, um, something we've uh, found out recently by doing a study on, on sustainability is that uh, DNA promises to, to be better also from, from a sustainability perspective. So uh, for metrics that we looked at uh, to store one terabyte of information for a year, it looks like the greenhouse gas emissions, the energy consumption and the water consumption will be lower for DNA. So we still need to build the system to validate these numbers, but the numbers uh, look pretty promising as well. All right, so here, if, we, if we're gonna build a DNA data storage system, how, what does that look? And uh, so here is uh, what it looks like. So the, the first transition encoding from bits into bases. So this happens in the electronic domain. So we're essentially using a computer to translate bits into sequences of bases uh, to be manufactured. 
And then we go through the manufacturing process. Once we have the molecules and the data is uh, safely stored in the molecules, we will preserve the information that's in the DNA and, and that uh, information uh, or the molecules will be encapsulated and put away. And then when, it, when it's time to read the information again, we'll retrieve the molecules we want to read. That's the random access. We'll sequence them and then we'll decode the information recovering the bits. What we've done so far uh, is to store the information, about one gigabit of information. We've stored and recovered uh, this information. And what we um, wanted to make a point it, that about is that uh, we encoded different types of media. And we did that because we wanted to make the point that if you can encode that into, into bits, you can encode them into DNA as well. And so we've encoded books from the Gutenberg, from Project Gutenberg, so the, the 100 uh, top books in Project Gutenberg. We've encoded the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We've encoded the high definition OK Go video. In fact, I would highly recommend that, that video. Uh, we've encoded databases. We've encoded archival quality music from the Montreux Jazz Festival and so forth and so on. And um, this uh, one gigabyte may not sound like a, a, a big deal when it comes to information storage, but from a biotech uh, perspective, that's, that's actually quite a big deal. And this has landed us on the, the cover of uh, Nature Biotechnology. That, that paper, um, we, in that paper, we describe our experience of encoding uh, 200 megabytes of information in DNA. And, um, and after that, we've encoded 800 megabytes more. But uh, as far as we know, this is the most data uh, ever stored in DNA uh, published in a, a peer review publication. So looking at the evolution of DNA here, what I'm showing is um, how much it's been growing, how the capacity uh, stored in DNA has been growing over time. So what you're seeing on the y axis, the, on the x axis is um, years and on the y-axis is the amount of information that has been stored and note that the the y-axis here is um, is a logarithmic and so th that that essentially means that the capacity has been growing exponentially over the years and I hope it will continue uh, to do so. So now what I thought I'd do is uh, walk you through uh, this pipeline in more detail. So let's see how, how exactly we do this process of uh, storing digital data in DNA and recovering, recovering it. Um, first step is the encoding. So this video uh, that we encoded is about 44 megabytes of information. But as I mentioned to you earlier, um, it's easy to fabricate molecules of DNA that's, uh, that are about 150 to 230 um, basis long, and that means that we can store about um, 15 to 30 bytes in each of the molecules, each of the sequences. And so the first step is really taking this, um, taking this file and chopping it up into smaller pieces, pieces that will fit into molecules of DNA. Next, uh, we add the sequence number so that we can find them uh, when it's time to recover the information and reorder them in the original sequence that uh, the file uh, encoded. We add some redundant uh, information, and that's for error correction purposes on the way out, on the way, uh, the decoding path. We'll translate then those sequences into, uh, from bits into, uh, into bases. We'll add a tag and think of this as a file ID or, or as a, a, some object ID of some sort. Um, so that all the molecules that are part of the same file or the same data object are tagged with the same ID. And so we know that they belong to that file and we can recover that file as a unit. All right, so the next step, now we know the sequences that we want to store in DNA. So the next step is really to manufacture the molecules. And uh, the, that process is called DNA synthesis. And um, essentially, it's a, a, a number of different chemical steps uh, where different reagents are brought in uh, that are used to build the DNA or to grow the DNA base by base. And the process is very much like, you know, the, the way to visualize it is grass growing from, uh, from the ground up. So bases are added one by one in that particular blade of, gr of grass. 
Um, obviously, we don't gr grow a single blade at a time. There's a process called a ray synthesis that grows different sequences in parallel. So once the molecules are grown, uh, they're removed from uh, that surface where the, they grew and they are encapsulated. And this is so that the DNA is preserved over a long period of time. And then the DNA is organized, so it's not a mountain of DNA um, altogether. It's organized into a library, and, uh, which is uh, what I'm showing here is a DNA library, much like a library of tape uh, that's used to store digital information is organized. So it's organized spatially, and if you need a particular piece of data, you know in which location to find it. So... That library is stored, it's preserved and it's stored under the right conditions for the DNA to be stable. And when it's time to read uh, the information, uh, we'll retrieve the molecules from, uh, from the library and then uh, it's time to sequence it or read the information in the molecules. So sequencing, uh, there's multiple ways of uh, sequencing DNA. Uh, the most used today is an optical uh, method where uh, whenever you want to read the DNA, you're essentially making a copy of it. And so uh, a base will be added that's complementary to the base in the DNA. So remember how I said uh, DNA is a double helix and each side of the double helix has a, a sequence of bases. Well, if on one side of the double helix you have an A, on the other side you have a T. If on one side you have a C, on the other side you have a G. And so they're, they're matched together so that from an information storage perspective, they're redundant. But we can actually leverage this process to read the information in the DNA. So here in this example here, what just happened, um, let me replay that, is that a T that was flown in into the uh, flow cell, which is where the DNA that's being read sits in, in this machine, um, a T with a fluorescent uh, group, that's, that's essentially a chemical that fluoresces attached to this molecule here. So we know that uh, T's normally attached to A's and therefore the, um, this green light that we're seeing coming from that location corresponds to an A. And uh, likewise, uh, we, can repeat the, uh, we can repeat this process. So remove that uh, fluorescent group and attach the next base. In this case, it's a G with a, a yellowish um, fluorophore, and so we're, we're seeing a different, uh, different base uh, identified there, uh, and that, that's complementary to the C, so we know there's a C in that position, and so forth and so on. So what this machine generates is essentially a number of different sequences of the molecules that it thinks is observed. Now, this is all inferred by the, the optical properties, and so it, there are a few errors that accumulate because of the process itself. Here's another method. This is called nanopore reading or nanopore sequencing technology. And this device uh, is essentially a handheld device. And it, the, the way it reads the DNA is electronic. So the DNA is forced through this nanopore. So it's a nanoscale pore. The DNA is forced through uh, that pore. And as it goes through, it um, uh, disturbs the ionic current of uh, the liquid that's, that's going through the pore. And by depending on which bases are going through that pore, it generates a different electrical signal that, that can be inferred uh, to uh, the original molecule that, that's probably uh, going, uh, going through that nanopore. And so it, again, the sequencing technology gener generates a bunch of what's called reads, and those are uh, noisy representations of the molecules observed by the, uh, by the sequencer. So now we have a bunch of reads, um, and th those are sequences, and we need to translate back into the, the bits. So let's see how this is done. The decoding process starts by clustering the reads, and so what we're doing is essentially finding reads that are likely to have come from the same location in the original file. And then for each of these clusters, we'll do majority voting and to determine what's the most likely sequence that came from that position. The next step is to take these uh, majority voted sequences and translate them back into bits uh, just by the, the mapping that we had used in the beginning. <clears throat> 
and then reordering them based on their sequence number. And uh, even though most of the, the bits we've stored uh, come back and, and we can recover them, some of them actually uh, don't. And so they're missing molecules and, and the information in them is gone. And so, uh, but we've, um, if you remember in the beginning and the encoding part, we actually added some redundancy. And so we can use that redundancy now to recover the original data. So this, obviously, there's quite a bit of uh, computer science and uh, coding theory that goes into creating these codes. Um, but luckily, we have at uh, Microsoft Research a, a great team of people working on this. So once we have these uh, sequences of bits, we can reorder them and reassemble the original file. So this is how, uh, in a nutshell, we store um, the, the information in DNA and then are able uh, to recover it. So this is again the pipeline that uh, we just talked about. And essentially th the last thing I wanted to point out about it is that there's, there's parts of it that are you know, in the electronic domain, there's parts of it that, that are in the molecular domain and then we recover uh, the information uh, to the electronic domain. So essentially we have an electronic molecular uh, hybrid system here. And we're using uh, the different, uh, different technologies for what they do best. Ultimately, what we'd like to get to is, is a system like this, right? It's a system that can write, store, and read uh, information to and from uh, DNA that we can place in a data center, then wrap a, a service around it and offer, uh, for example, an archival storage service to, to our customers. So once we achieve something like this, uh, the next question is, can, can we do any kind of computation directly into molecules so that we don't need to read the information back so that we can process? So can we process the information uh, at the molecular level? And it turns out that uh, certain kinds of computations can be done directly in the molecule. So let me tell you a little bit about that. So here's the assumption. We, we've stored a bunch of information in DNA, and uh, we have certain operations that need to be done, for example, over all of those pieces of information, right? So for example, search. Search is a good example of that. Um, if we want to search a particular da database, we may have to look at all the, all the elements in the database to, uh, to get uh, uh, something we're, we're looking for, right? Um, so we target these kinds of algorithms uh, where parallelism can actually be quite helpful. And also we think that uh, using molecules and, and those properties of DNA of binding, A binding to, to T and C binding to G, uh, to do energy efficient computation, especially when it comes to search. So let me show you what property of DNA that we're, we're exploring. So here what I'm showing is uh, different molecules of DNA. The top one is the normal double helix that we think about, where uh, A's uh, match uh, T's and, and C's match G's uh, exactly, right? And what keeps that molecule together are the attraction forces between those pairs of bases. So A's att attracting T's and, and C's attracting G's, right? And so that, that force is, is quite strong and it keeps the molecule together, right, as a unit. Now, that doesn't mean that if there's a one mismatch, the molecule will fall, fall apart, right? Um, so if there's a good partial match, which is what I'm showing here on the, on the bottom left, um, the molecule will still you know, stick together. It may not stick as strongly as before, but, it, but the, there's still some attraction between the two sides of the double helix. And then even poor partial matches sometimes uh, may still, you know, there may still uh, be some attraction. So let me show you how we would uh, use that um, for search. So this is how we use DNA for search. On the left-hand side, um, let's say there's a database here for illustration purposes. There are three, uh, three items in the database and each of the items is represented by three molecules. So we have three copies of the same molecule of the same sequence representing each item. And in the middle, what we have is a, a query and that query is connected to a magnetic nanoparticle. And so we can physically actuate over that magnetic man nanoparticle by using a magnet. So once uh, all of these molecules are mixed, what we expect to see is the following. Uh, 
if there's a perfect match, we're going to see very strong attraction between the query and uh, a database item. And so all the molecules, all the copies of that particular item are going to come together with the query and form this very strong double helix structure. If there is a not so perfect match, uh, just a good match, Molecules are still going to come together, but probably fewer of them will come together because the forces are, are not as strong. And then if there are poor partial matches, you know, maybe fewer uh, pairs will form. And, um, and then we can use this property to really search a database. So how do we do that? So imagine we have a database of images, and here I'm showing uh, these uh, four images as examples. Um, by using just regular machine learning techniques, we can extract a feature vector from each of these uh, images that sort of describes that, that image. And then um, instead of storing or further processing those feature vectors, we will actually train a neural network uh, to translate these feature vectors into sequences of DNA, such that if images are similar, they are likely to have similar sequences of DNA representing them in that database. And then when we have a query like this, so this is uh, again a binocular, we have a binocular here in the database as well, uh, we'll do feature extraction over that new query, over, over that image, extract a feature vector and run it through the same, uh, the same neural network. Now, um, these sequences representing the two binoculars are similar, but if we want them to stick together, what we need to do is essentially invert um, and what's called reverse complement uh, the query or the sequence representing that query so that um, essentially every C becomes a G, every T becomes an A, and so that molecule is the molecule that's likely to stick to the image we're looking for when it's mixed into the database of images. And then we can use a magnetic uh, or a magnet to pull it because the query is attached to a magnetic nanoparticle. So that's how uh, we're doing search in DNA. Uh, we've had quite a bit of success in um, uh, recovering uh, images that are, that are similar and we have uh, one uh, DNA24 uh, paper on that, uh, and uh, one more um, under submission right now. So hopefully we'll, you'll see you know, more news about this uh, soon. All right, so uh, I've talked quite a bit about this um, in the um, abstract, but one, one uh, very common way to doing all these experiments and, and showing demonstrating the system and understanding the behavior of DNA is what you're seeing in this picture here is essentially by hand. So synthesis and, and sequencing today are actually, you know, the commercial synthesis and sequencing are actually um, automated, fully automated, but what happens in between still relies on manual steps like this one. Um, so uh, we wanted to understand what it took to really build a system end-to-end, -end, a fully automated system for DNA storage. Our point uh, was not really to build a large-scale system of any sort. We, we wanted to demonstrate that it was possible to do the entire process um, using uh, just automation without any human intervention. Um, but again, the point of this was not scaling up, was um, was really uh, proving uh, automation. And so we built this um, contraption here. And what I'm showing here is essentially a DNA data storage system, fully automated DNA data storage system. On the left-hand side, what you're seeing is a bunch of bottles. Those are the bottles and the reagents needed to make DNA. And even you know those four smaller bottles you see in the back are the, the four different uh, bases. Uh, those are uh, you know, just solutions that carry those bases. Uh, now in the middle, what you're seeing is essentially the uh, storage and preparation uh, unit. And then on the right-hand side, uh, you're seeing the sequencing portion of the system. And what you're seeing there uh, is uh, the nanopore device that I was talking about earlier. So we integrated the nanopore device with the, the rest of the system here. Um, so this is um, a detail of the 
the actual place where we're storing the DNA is in the bottom of this, this tube here. Um, so we, we used this contraption to write the word hello in DNA, and then we were able to fully uh, recover that uh, without any hands-on effort. So this, this was uh, fully automated. All right, but um, you know that, that library that I showed here can essentially store one, uh, one particular pool of DNA. If we want uh, 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 a bigger library, then we need to think about how to do that. Um, so there's a library of tape, uh, and we kept thinking, what's the equivalent of that for DNA data storage? And uh, essentially, this is what we came up with. Um, so this is a device based on digital microfluidics. So let me tell you a little more about that. The effect that we're explore, exploiting here is called electrobedding. Um, so essentially, we can sandwich droplets of fluid carrying DNA or carrying other reagents between a computer board, a PCB, which is the, um, the purple board that, that you're seeing there, or the, the, the green board in the, the, next, uh, the next image. And um, so the droplet is sandwiched between the board and a sheet of uh, conductive glass. And depending on where we apply voltages across the, the sheet and the board, uh, we're going to deform the, the droplets so that uh, we can operate over them. So we can move them, uh, we can split them, we can merge them, and so forth and so on. And that allows us to uh, both use it as a library um, to you know, park different droplets of fluid on uh, the 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 glass plate and, and store, you know, just dry the molecules and store them there, uh, but also use the platform to prepare the molecules to uh, read the DNA and to process, uh, to process the DNA. Um, we've also uh, wanted to make it closed loop, so we added a camera. This is what you're seeing in the middle, so a board with a, a, a green droplet there, and the camera is the, the blue base, uh, is on a blue base, and it's what that... Um, uh, circuit that's that's hanging upside down there uh, on the top and um, essentially we use the, the camera to observe the movement of uh, the droplet around the, the platform and uh, by using the camera we can also identify the droplets and, and track them as they're operated over so uh, on the right hand side here what you're seeing is a video um, that is tracking these uh, these droplets, and so uh, you know the first few frames show the, the the different droplets being identified with an ID, and then when they merged, they have a new ID, and so we can track where the droplets are going and what they're being mixed with. Um, so obviously, you know that that's the hardware, but it also requires uh, a little bit of uh, programming uh, to be useful. So. Uh, when we started, we had the hardware and a, a pretty simple assembly code that allowed us to activate the different electrodes to move the fluids around. Um, but it felt like there was an opportunity here to, again, apply computer science um, to uh, the system. And so, uh, again, in collaboration with the University of Washington, we developed a, a puddle, which is essentially a, a runtime uh, that allows uh, composition of different functions uh, to manipulate droplets on the board. So, for example, we can implement a process called PCR, which is the process of copying the molecules and amplifying the information, so just copying the information. And uh, this essentially um, uh, can be implemented uh, with the language on top of this, this platform here. So um, right now we're essentially building this stack uh, with DNA data storage in mind, but hopefully in the future uh, we'll see uh, adoption of it for uh, high throughput experiments, for medical diagnostics, and so forth and so on. This is essentially one uh, particular example of automation uh, that uh, connects the molecular domain and the electronic domain. So in this talk we've seen uh, the the end-to-end -end system we've seen uh, synthesis and sequencing and we've seen uh, the purple drop uh, technology. Uh, but the bigger point I wanted to make is that I, I think we're going to see more of these these systems where there's an interface between the molecular domain and the electronic domain. And just like you know today we see 
CPUs being accelerated by GPUs and FPGAs, I think that uh, tomorrow we're going to see different types of systems, um, so quantum systems is an example, but also biomolecules as, as hopefully I've shown you uh, during, the, uh, during the presentation today, that we can use uh, biomolecules both uh, to store information and to compute certain types of uh, computations, so to, to perform certain types of uh, computations using molecules. Um, but overall, I think the, the, the thing we need to think about is what, what technology fits a particular problem better, and, and really I think the future is a, a variety of these technologies operating together. So with that, I wanted to conclude by saying this is the work of a, a, a large team of people. So this is not uh, just me and uh, Luis says in my peer at University of Washington, but really a team of uh, very talented and, and super motivated researchers. Uh, it's a very diverse team, um, you know, lots of different backgrounds, all the way from coding theory to molecular biology. And we are uh, super happy and, and super excited to, to work um, on, on this topic. So with that, we're going to transition into a live Q&A session. So if you'd like to participate in that, uh, please uh, stay tuned. Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending the DNA Data Storage and Computation webinar and live q and I'm Karen Strauss, a Principal Research Manager here at Microsoft, and over the next 15 minutes or so, we're going to be answering top questions uh, submitted by the audience during the webinar. So let's get started. Our first question relates to what type of DNA we use for data storage. So one thing I want to emphasize and clarify is that we're not using biological DNA, we're using synthetic DNA. This means that there's no organisms, no life related to the DNA that we're using. It's really the DNA that's manufactured by a chemical process. So it's the same material, but there are no cells, no organisms, and no life associated to the DNA that we're using for data storage. Second question is, is there a reason why we wouldn't use DNA for encoding data? And relatedly, uh, a different question asked, apart from DNA, has there been any interest in other types of synthetic molecules for data storage or computation? And could we design our own DNA-like molecule with, say, uh, 16 bases instead of four? Okay, so let's start with the RNA question. You could use the same process to uh, use RNA for data storage. It turns out RNA is, is a single-stranded, so it's only one side uh, typically of that double helix, and so it's not as stable as DNA. And then if we wanted to use other types of molecules, yes, um, you could use other types of synthetic molecules, and it turns out there is research in this area. Um, what's um, the, There are two reasons why we... Uh, don't see that uh, uh, these uh, synthetic molecules uh, in, in use, in widespread use today. And this is because, um, you know, there are more tools to manipulate DNA. So um, the tools to synthesize or to write the DNA, to manipulate or copy the DNA, and to read the DNA are more widespread. They're more available. And so it's easier as a starting point to use DNA. It doesn't mean that we'll never use other types of synthetic molecules for data storage and computation, uh, but this is what's uh, most easily uh, available today. So that, that's what, where we start. Could we design our own uh, DNA-like molecule with more bases? So instead of having the ATCNG, natural bases, could we have it with um, different, uh, different bases that, that would uh, essentially enrich our vocabulary of symbols and therefore uh, would make us able to store more bits per base. Would uh, we, We'd be able to map more bits per, per base of DNA. And it turns out that there are synthetic uh, bases of DNA that look different, that are not the ATC and G. However, um, uh, the thing to, uh, to keep in mind is that 
if we have four bases, as I showed in the beginning of the presentation, we can encode four different combinations of two bits each. If we have, if we double the number of bases, for example, we uh, we had eight different bases, A, T, C, and G, and then R, S, R, S and X, Y, for example, we'd be able to encode, you know, there's eight different bases to choose from. However, those eight different bases means that we can encode three bits because uh, those would cover the all the eight combinations of three bits, all the way from 000, 001, and etc. to 110111. And so there's eight combinations there of bits, therefore we can encode three bits. So with four bases, we, we can encode two bits. With eight bases, we can encode three bits. With 16 bases, we can encode four bits. And so every time we want to encode an extra bit, we need to double the number of bases. And it turns out that designing these artificial synthetic bases is a non-trivial task. So there, there is a possibility of using more bases, but it may not pay off as much as the work it takes to create uh, some more of those. All right, next question is, are there any limitations to uh, the sequences of synthetic DNA. In other words, are there any sequences that cannot be created, cannot be synthesized? It turns out that some sequences are harder than others, um, not only to synthesize or write, uh, but also to copy and to be read. And luckily, uh, when we encode bits into uh, DNA, uh, we can choose how to do that encoding and we can choose to avoid some of these sequences. And by avoiding these sequences, we make it easier for ourselves to write the DNA, manipulate the DNA and read the DNA. All right, uh, next question was, does the DNA medium cause natural errors analogous to hardware errors in electronics? Yes, uh, there are errors throughout the process, so both in writing uh, manipulating the DNA and uh, as the DNA ages, certain errors are introduced, and then in reading the DNA. Uh, it turns out that just like other hardware errors, there are mechanisms for error correction. And so this is, this is what we do. We use mathematical codes to avoid these errors. Uh, and by avoid, I mean uh, we encode redundant information but in a mathematical way that allows us to encode not that much more information together with uh, the original information we want to store. And when it's time to, rec uh, to recover the data, we can use that redundancy that we inserted in the beginning of the process to recover the bits despite errors in uh, the molecules, in the bases, in the reading, the writing of those DNA molecules. So we can recover the information because we're using coding theory, we're using mathematical concepts to, uh, to be able to recover that from not that much more additional data. Next question is, is it possible to replicate data in synthetic DNA? Yes, it's possible. Um, all we need to do is to copy the molecules and it turns out there's a process called PCR or polymerase chain reaction uh, that precisely copies DNA. So we can make uh, many copies, in fact, many copies in parallel um, and replicate the data in that way. And so once the copies are made, we can just divide that material into two and then we have two copies or more copies, right? All right, uh, next question is also about copying. So if the data is needed to be copied how's the integrity of the information preserved? In, in other words, how would we prevent quote unquote generic drift in the information? Um, so generic, uh, uh, excuse me, genetic drift in the information. So um, this is referring to changes in the basis. So if you have an original sequence of DNA, let's see, let's say it's um, ACT and G, uh, that sequence and instead um, in copying, you know, there's an error and the copied uh, sequence is ACCG. Um, so we, we had a substitution there. 
And again, the those uh, smart mathematical models that I was talking about, uh, mathematical techniques uh, coming from coding theory, help us recover the information bit by bit, despite neither of these processes, neither the, the writing, the copying, or the reading process uh, being exactly precise. Uh, they do insert errors and we can correct and recover the bits despite the errors in the, the molecules and the, the processes to read and write and copy. All right, so next question was how well does DNA store in archival format? So does it need to be dehydrated or frozen or kept in certain environmental conditions? So the best conditions to maintain DNA are cool, dark, and away from uh, from uh, moisture, from from water, away from oxygen. Um, so, one of the the methods to store the DNA is, is to freeze it at very low temperatures. Another method is to dehydrate it, um, sometimes seal it with some kind of inert gas. So there are multiple ways to maintain the the DNA, it's all a function of how long we want to preserve the DNA and uh, how, you know, other properties that we may want. Perhaps we don't want to keep it super cold, and so, but, but we have the ability to seal the DNA in some, some kind of sealed chamber with inert gases. That, that would be a, a method. There are ways to encapsulate the DNA with... Um, Silicon dioxide, um, so it's kind of like a synthetic bone um, that involves the DNA and really protects it from, from degradation um, and keeping it away from, from light as well is uh, something that's, that's recommended. So there's, there's a number of uh, different conditions and combinations of conditions that can be used to preserve the DNA and make it last for a longer amount of time, which essentially pre preserves the data that's encoded in the DNA. All right, so next question is if, if uh, DNA storage uh, space gets contaminated, uh, meaning there's some uh, biological DNA perhaps that in, is introduced in the mix, is there a way to, to fix the data and so recover the data um, uh, where that contamination happened? So it turns out that when we create sequences of DNA for data storage, they look very different from biological sequences of DNA. And moreover, the copying process allows us to specifically copy uh, the, the different uh, molecules that were used for that data storage. And so um, it turns out that we can, um, that we can recover uh, only the molecules that were used for data storage and not necessarily for um, you know, not necessarily the biological ones. So we can separate them uh, by, uh, looking at the structure of the molecule and, and taking advantage of that. All right, um, this is a question about the digital microfluidics platform that I showed um, in one of those lines where, where we showed the, the droplets moving, right? So uh, the question is what kind of timescales do these droplets uh, move on? Uh, so, and, and then a related question was how fast it can mix and in what sort of DNA quantities. So the platform you saw moves droplets that are about two uh, to tens of uh, microliters of um, uh, DNA solution, right? So that's DNA in uh, water or some kind of buffered solution, so water and different salts. Um, and and that's, those are the quantities that are moved by that particular platform that I was uh, showing in, in the video. You can move smaller uh, uh, droplets as well with a diff different sorts of um, digital microfluidics platforms. Uh, time scale, so in the platform I showed, uh, droplets can move uh, millimeters per second is sort of a, a, a reasonable unit to, to think about those. Um, so uh, it, it turns out that it's actually quite quick when you, when you see, you know, the demo. Um, I don't know how easy it was to see in the video, uh, in the webinar, but, um, but that's, that's a real time. We did not accelerate um, the, uh, the speed of the droplet, so that's real time uh, speed. 
Next question, from your results, um, would DNA data storage be more suitable for cold storage, hot storage, or both? And how far, different question as how far are we from having this technology in laptops and mobile phones? So I can comment, I think, on where I think we're going to see DNA data storage first. I think we're going to see it uh, for cold storage uh, in data centers. And, and this is uh, because... Uh, you know, that's where the technology is right now. It takes a little while to get to the data, so it's not instant like what we're used to with hard drives. Um, I expect that it will uh, become faster and faster to access data in uh, DNA. Um, and but but I think it, it's it's pretty clear that we're starting uh, with uh, cold storage at this point. And then a uh, question about uh, how how far. Uh, are we from having technology in laptops and, and mobile phones? Um, again, we're probably going to see DNA data storage in data centers before we see it in laptops and mobile phones. And this is because it's easier to create the conditions. The conditions are more controlled in a data center. Um, and so it's easier to, um, to place such a new device in a data center environment rather than a laptop or a mobile phone. So the, the jury is still out on when we're going to see laptops and mobile phones have uh, the technology. Um, but, um, uh, you know, it, it seems like it will get there someday. All right, different question. Assuming uh, we're successful uh, in enabling DNA data storage, uh, will computation ever C's being electronic, so will we still have electronic computers or, or not? And I think we will. Um, there, are, there are things that DNA is good for, there are things that electronics are uh, is good for, and it's really the combination of electronics, molecules, potentially quantum computing, and so forth and so on, that, that's, that's going to be, you know, platforms of, of the future are, are going to include I think they're going to include all of those components. And this is not very different from platforms today. So we have uh, CPUs, but we also have GPUs. We have FPGAs and other, other types of electronics and different technologies in our systems. And they do different things. Um, and we use um, the best technology for the best task. Um, so we'll see combinations of, of these technologies in the future as well. All right. It looks like we have time for one more question today. Um, so, uh, here's the last question. If someone wanted to get involved with this kind of research, what kind of background education training would they need to possess? Okay, so to, to answer that question, I think the, the best is to um, say what kinds of competencies we cover within our team here at Microsoft. It, it's actually a pretty uh, broad team, the, even more with the collaboration uh, with University of Washington. So, um, you know, it's, it's quite broad and there's a variety of different backgrounds, education and training uh, people can have and, and work on a project. So this is, goes all the way from uh, coding theory, which is uh, part of uh, theoretical computer science, to algorithms, um, to background in uh, computer architecture, electrical and mechanical engineering, molecular biology, biochemistry, and so forth and so on. So there's quite a, a wide array of uh, different disciplines uh, to, to study. Um, I think it's fair to say that nobody in our team is specialist on all of those areas. Um, but really, one cool thing about the project is that we, we are all coming together um, creating the same language and, and being able to communicate across the different disciplines to really, you know, create a system that strides all of these disciplines and, um, and essentially delivers on um, this promise of uh, DNA data storage and computation. So with that, I'd, I'd like to thank you all for attending today. Uh, we really appreciate your participation and your interest in, in the subject. If you're interested to, to learn more, we have listed some great resources in the resource list, um, and that's uh, to the right of your screen. Uh, the list includes you know, papers we've written on DNA data storage, on uh, DNA computation, and even one uh, that mixes DNA data storage and art. Um, so that's, that's 
uh, what you're going to find in the resources list. Uh, we look, look forward to seeing how you, you build on this research and, and evolve uh, DNA data storage. Um, so that's it for today. Have a great day. Bye-bye.